question is, do you agree that Scotland should be an independent country? For me, the principle that we work best and we work together. Well, they didn't. Very serious. The referendum. It seems to me that they're not dealing with the issues. Hello, this is Scottish Independence Podcast number 58. This time I've taken the speeches from a recent event that was held in Leith last month. We've got the talks given and then the question and answer session at the end. The speakers were Fiona Hislop, the Scottish Culture Secretary, then Robin McAlpine of the Reid Foundation, and then Michelle Thompson from Business for Scotland, and finally Colin Fox of the SSP. So we'll just go straight to it and I hope you enjoy it. and thank you for the invitation to be here and to share this evening with you. I, uh, my last memories of being in this area was when I stood against Billy Fitzpatrick. You know, yeah. I came within 90 votes of becoming the councillor here and I stood against Billy Fitzpatrick. And I understand Neil Lindsay's here, so nice to see uh, Neil here tonight as well. When I was campaigning, it was my early, early years, a long time ago, we were campaigning against the poll tax. Another example of a tax imposed in Scotland that we didn't vote for. And we used to have meetings in the old Craig Royce in the high school where we were campaigning uh, against the poll tax then. And I couldn't understand why I was so exhausted when I was doing that campaign election. And it turns out I was pregnant with my first child. Uh, that first child is now 18, and she'll be getting her first vote for independence this year. Children, as, as, as mentioned, I've got somebody six, somebody 16, he also will have his vote this year, a nine year old. And yes, I represent the Scottish Government, and yes, I'm doing this for my country, but I'm also doing it for the future and for my children. Because what I want to see for them is a country that's built on hope, on op- optimism, and opportunity for all. And a Scotland that is fair and just, and that can hold its head up proudly in the world. Not to say that we're any better than any other country, but to say we're as equal as any other country in the world. And what we're facing just now is a choice of two futures. This is an exciting time for Scotland. As part of my responsibilities in external affairs in the Scottish Government, I I travel but I also meet people internationally. And the eyes of the world are on that decision that we will take this year. And perhaps we should think, what type of Scotland would you want to see? And therefore, what solution, what democratic solution would build that Scotland that you want to see? And what would a modern, progressive, social democratic country on the north of Europe actually look like if we could shape it ourselves? And all of you will have different reasons for coming here tonight. And all of you will have different reasons if you've made up your mind for voting yes as to what that would be. And I always remember what my granny used to say to me when I used to fight with my brother. And she'd always she'd put this in front of her. She'd say, right, OK, what's the story? And we'd say our story. And she said, OK, there's your truth, my truth, and the real truth. And with independence, there will be different stories about why people want to be independent. There's your independence, there's my independence, there's Colin's independence, there's Michelle's independence, and there's Robin's. But from that cauldron of ideas and possibilities, we most certainly can build a society and a country that we can be proud of, but probably more important, our children and our grandchildren can be proud of. And everyone's talking about this. I was, um, part of my responsibilities takes me to interesting places. Last week I was on top of the fourth bridge, the fourth rail bridge, an amazing experience, a once in a lifetime experience up there looking, seeing everything, you can even see here and all the different kind of the places over in Fife. And I was up there and we were launching the UNESCO heritage bid for the, for the rail bridge. And we were up and we did our interviews, it was yeah, a bit chilly, but it was nice and sunny, we could see. And when you get up there, you have to go up on a cage, it's like a lift to 75 degrees. And so I was fine actually, I was surprised that some of the guys were a bit iffy, you know, they were a bit scared. So we spent the time up there for about an hour, and we're about to come down on the lift, and here, up at the top of the fourth bridge, and the guy, the lift engineer, the lift operator, comes up to us, he says, this is your SNP, he says, are we going to win this referendum? You know, so even people at the top of the fourth bridge are talking about us. <laughs> and I think you remember that, because each and one, every one of us has a responsibility to make sure we go into this referendum informed, engaged and debating. And that's a good thing, 
because Scotland, if, if and everything else, it's an argument, it's a debate. We like to have that debate and discussion, and we can take on all comers. And can I just say to George Osmond, I am fed up of Westminster politicians, Westminster establishment elite, coming to Scotland and telling us what we can and cannot do. what we can't do with our currency. Well, actually, in terms of our decisions, mandate respect for a yes vote in September the 18th will be what directs and dictates how governments, both governments, will behave responsibly on the day thereafter. But it is a choice of two futures. It's not about independence versus the status quo. When you're looking and thinking about that new Scotland, what is it going to look like? And what's it going to look like if you vote no? So I want to, to make the case about why we can be independent, why we should be independent, and why we must be independent. Why we can be independent. There is general acknowledgement now in the debate. Compared to maybe a year ago, everybody has now acknowledged that Scotland has the financial capability of being independent. In terms of what we contribute, we know we contribute in terms of taxation, 9.9% of taxes that go to the UK. We've only got 8.4% of the population. We more than pay it our own way. In terms of our strength, in terms of paying for things, in terms of paying for pensions, social security and all the rest of it, we have a capability and in fact our public service expenditure as a percentage of GDP is less than the UK. The UK's position is quite different from ours. We have a stronger position in relation to debt. The UK's debt per GDP is much higher than it is for Scotland. Uh, theirs is 72% of GDP, uh, per head now is 62%. It's less if you take a historic share as well. So some of the problems, I think it's quite interesting to, to talk about the perspective of this. And we have to have confidence in our own selves and our own arguments, because other people do, and other people see the strengths that we have. All these assets that we have, all the, all, all the, all the possibilities for Scotland, in terms of our energy resources, Yes, we've got oil and gas, which I would remind Mr Osmond contributes £30 billion pounds to the balance of payments of the UK underpinning the economy. That will be Scotland's in an independent Scotland. That will be ours in terms of to deploy as we might, to, might, we might wish. In terms of the capability, we can more than pay our own way. And I think that's going to be important in terms of where we are. David Cameron has also recognised that we more than pay our own way in terms of recognising we are capable of being an independent uh, country. And his quote is quite interesting. So whenever MD might say this, and it's not often I do quote David Cameron, but I do quote him now, supportive, supporters of independence will always be able to cite examples of small, independent, thriving economies across Europe, such as Finland, Switzerland, and Norway. It would be wrong to suggest that Scotland could not be another such successful independent country. We know that we can be an independent country, we can afford independence. The opposition, the no campaign, know we can afford to be independent. So the argument has moved on now. Those arguments of a year ago have now moved on. So the question is, should we? Should we be independent? Well, think about what we have achieved. I am frustrated in the Scottish Parliament. We end up delivering results that's one high hand tied behind our back. But look what we've done within that limited powers. Free education, in my blog, you didn't... John put out that I was the minister who abolished tuition fees in Scotland, and that was the restoration of free education to this country. We did it because we had the political will to make sure we had free education in this country. We also delivered free personal care, and that was as a parliament. We've got free eye and dental checks. We've also defended the NHS against the privatisation, which is so damaging, and you see that south of the border. So we've all done that within a limited and fixed budget. John Swinney is our finance secretary. He has to land the budget in uh, with no debt. It's illegal for us to do it with anything else. So he does make sure that we have a balanced budget each and every, way, each and every year. We're capable of running our own affairs. And there are that point, if we're capable of running some of our affairs and doing it well and doing it with the interest and the value of the Scottish people at hand, why, why are we capable of running some of the affairs? but not all of the affairs of Scotland. And this comes back to the democratic argument. Half the years since the end of the Second World War, Scotland has received a Westminster government that we have not voted for. Half of the time over that period. And that, to me, is the democratic deficit that brings us all together, whatever your perspective of whatever you want, from independence and for independence. 
the things that we could do to transform. Why should we? We can transform our society. We can transform our economy. I have got confidence in what we can do, what we're capable of. I, I believe that the Scottish people have great assets in their capability, in their know-how, in their ingenuity. And we've just got to liberate and make sure that that energy and that possibility, that capability can be realised, not just for some of our society, but for all of our society. We've heard so much from others as to what we can do and how we can do that and the different ideas that we can to, do, to, to deal with that. But also one of the things that we are putting forward in terms of the proposition is what you could do, for example, in childcare. Hugely important for women getting back to work, hugely important for tackling poverty in our society. But when we try and implement things in Scotland, all we're doing is putting money out and not getting the benefit of it. All the extra additional taxes and productivity that comes from more families working, more women working, goes back to the Treasury, doesn't come back to Scotland, can't be spent in Scotland. And that's the, that's the, the, the virtuous cycle that we can do with independence, is to make sure that we get the benefit of all those progressive policies that we can implement. And I want a country that does not engage in illegal wars. I want a country that doesn't have nuclear weapons. And if you look at the threats and the challenges internationally, it's not the old-fashioned type of threats that were at the time of the Berlin Wall or at the time of the 60s and the 70s. The real threats to our society as a global society are climate change. The real threats are the lack of access to water. The real threats are the lack of the inequalities that exist in societies across the world that causes pressures and causes and co cause so much difficulty and problems. And they're the real problems. And wouldn't it be great if Scotland could be that type of country that contributes to solving those problems rather than exploiting the problems that exist? And to me, that really is the vision of the type of country that we can be. So there should be, there should be is that capability of what we can do. And why must we be independent? Why must we be independent? Well, it is a choice of two futures. And what does no be like? Well, no means. Do you imagine waking up on September the 19th with a no vote? Do you think everybody at the Westminster establishment would be scrambling to give us more powers? Do you think they'll think, hang on Scotland, you've had your chance, that was it? Remember 1979 to 97 before anything happened. And they've had their chance. I sat in the parliament where we were discussing the extra Scotland bill that takes our uh, control over taxes from 7% to 15% of the Scottish Parliament. Nobody knows that there have been this world right, you know, this uh, amazing bill just passed in the Scottish Parliament just a couple of uh, years ago, because it wasn't amazing by any means. The other parties had the chance, Labour had the chance, the Tories had the chance to give us those powers just a couple of years ago, and they didn't do that. And that, to me, is a real concern, because no does look like austerity, no looks like more of the same. We have a Westminster Parliament and a Westminster establishment that is out of time, out of place, and out of touch. And if we really want to make sure we've got a parliament you can see, a government that you can reach out to, a government that you can make sure is accountable to you on each of these issues, we need to have it sooner, we need to have it in Edinburgh for a different type of society. So we do have a, a special moment, an important moment that we will not have again in our lifetimes to really make that big leap, that change, but to do it in confidence. If you believe in your neighbours, if you believe in your colleagues, if you believe in the people of Scotland, if you believe the bright, intelligent, capable people that I know that we have can run our own country. And if you look at other countries across Europe, smaller than Scotland, that sit at the top table while we sit behind, if not only that, if you want to make sure that we are a country that stands for peace and justice and for prosperity that can be shared for all, there is only one answer and that answer has to be yes. So on the 18th of September, when you hold, when you hold Scotland's future in your hands, when you hold Scotland's sovereignty in your hands, are you going to take forward, stand forward and take it and vote yes? and take that sovereignty so you hold it to share for your children and your grandchildren in the future, or are you going to say, it's okay, you can have it back? That's the choice, that's the decision. Great responsibility. I believe in the Scottish people, and I believe they'll vote yes.
I was totally not going to start with this. I don't usually expect people to reveal my darker, murkier past. I did work for the Labour Party. Um, I went down to London in 1995. Uh, I was a wee boy, just out of university. I've been a journalist for a couple of years. And this was it. This is our chance to change Britain, to get away from the, the, the elite domination of a nation, to change it once and for all, to fundamentally end the, the way that finance was running the British state. And what did we get? Tony Blair. <laughs> I was there for about 10 minutes when I realised it was going to go wrong. Uh, I was there for a year in total and I left. It was our best chance. It was our genuinely Britain's best chance to change, probably in my lifetime, when we blew it. This is Scotland's best chance to change in our lifetime. We can't even afford to blow it. And that's the best. How do you know it? Well, first of all, a lot of people might have given you the impression that this is as good as it gets. It most certainly is not as good as it gets. We don't get to talk very much. We're all, we're all chipping up and, and cheating in the Yes campaign. We never say the bad stuff, but I'll say a few of the bad stuff. Britain is the second lowest paid economy among the advanced economies. It is the worst, apart from Lithuania, it's the worst um, country in all of the European Union for giving workers any say at the work. It's industrial democracy, is dreadful. It's the eighth biggest gap in the European Union in pay between men and women. It's got one of the lowest pensions in uh, Europe, and of the 28 European countries, we are the fourth most likely to have pensioners living in poverty. Um, we have a productivity rate which is about 16% below the uh, average of advanced economies. We've got an innovation rate which is pathetic given the, the, the education levels and the, the, the quality of our university sector. Our exports, barring oil, are dreadful, really, really poor. And above all, we are the fourth most unequal country in the world. It's not as good as it gets. It's definitely not. In fact, in an awful lot of measures, you'd be better if you were virtually anywhere else. I think we don't hear enough. So, what is it about this fourth most unequal country? We hear it a lot, and I think people just assume that that in itself, oh, the fourth most equal country, that'll persuade them. You need to explain why this is. What's the problem with being the fourth most, fourth most unequal country in the world? Well, that problem, in its heart, stymies our chances to do anything that we want to do with our country. Let's assume that we want a country which isn't run only for its top 1%, that it's run for its people. That it's a, a country which shares its wealth, its resources, its successes, and its failures, shares them equally among its people. So we all get a decent chance. Because we've had 20 years of me first politics in Britain, and we all know that we all came second. We need a politics that puts all of us first, which is incidentally the tagline of Commonweal and um, allofusfirst.org is the website going to go on a blue. It's interesting to me that in all the world nobody thought registering the words allofusfirst.org in a row was worth doing. They were all available. I think that says something about global politics. But how do we do it? How do we put all of us first? Well, let's look at what happens if you've got inequality in a society. We want strong social services. We don't want to run deficits. We want to be able to invest in infrastructure. We want to do the things that everybody knows makes a good, equal, effective society. But we can do. And the reason for that is because of inequality. Nobody ever explains this properly. If you take the workforce that we have in Scotland just now, and you assume that a, a decent salary, a decent wage, which you can live with, you're not a tax dodger, you're not a tax lawyer, you're not, um, you're not relying on benefits, you're, you're paying, you're contributing, you know you can look after your family. Let's say that was a salary of £25,000 to £35,000. Of everybody who's in work in Scotland just now, only one in five earns between £25,000 and £35,000. Three out of five earn less than £25,000, and half of everybody who's in a job in Scotland earns less than £21,000. We are the second lowest paid economy of any advanced economy in the world. Only the United States is worse. So, is that just a bad thing for those in the low pay? No, it's a bad thing for us all. If we didn't have that massive inequality, if you took our labour market and you said, let's not bother pretending there's beneath economic growth, let's just distribute the wealth that we have more equally. We did this. It's paper on our website, the Foundation website called uh, Investing in a Good Society. And what we did was we remodeled the Scottish economy as if the people in that economy had the level of inequality, or rather the level of equality that they've got in the Nordic countries, and the level of participation in the labour market that they've got in these countries. Not growing the economy, just making it fairer. And what we did was we took that new data set and we ran it through the same tax model that the UK uses. If we could achieve the levels of equality that they've got in the Nordic country, we would generate four 
billion pounds of additional tax without raising tax. The reason that Britain's finances are a disaster is because half of the population is too poor to pay tax. Because we thrive, our corporations thrive on low pay. We have far, far too few indigenous Scottish companies making things, doing things. Britain's one of only two countries in the developed world that saw a decrease in its industrial production over the last 30 years. France was the other. They dropped by 4%, we dropped by 35 Germany increased by 50, Norway increased by 100. It isn't normal to be this rubbish. We can turn it round. We can fix this. All I really want to get the message across tonight is that Scotland has the knowledge of how to fix this. We have the skills and the people to fix it. God knows we've got the resources to fix it. And I'm absolutely convinced that we have got the will to fix it. The only thing to stop is the city of London, which won't let us fix it. The way we would fix this is make a proper economy. The big mistake that Gordon Brown made was that you can have a crap economy and fix it with taxing and tax transfers. Working tax credits were just a way of subsidising corporate low pay. Nobody did any better with it. Um, in fact, nobody did, any, did better with any Gordon Brown's policies. Ten years of economic growth and average wages didn't rise. It all went to people at the top of society. We can't have that anymore. The way that you change this and the way that you fix it is that you have a productive economy. An economy that does and makes things. If your economy is based on how to rip money out of other people, which is what our economy is, all you need is low pay. Now, the way this works is retail. Where does their profit come from? Your pockets. Property market. Where does the profit come from? Your pockets. The financial system. Where does the profit come from? Your pockets. These people aren't making things. These people aren't doing things. They're not creating value. They're grabbing your value. They take more out of our economy than we put back in. You look at an ordinary economy. You look at an effective economy. They make things. They do things. When you make things, when you do things, it needs skills. It needs people. When people have got skills, they get paid. That's how you create a high-wage economy. The other way you create a high-wage economy is to stop leaving workers on their own to fend against large corporations. We need industrial democracy, proper industrial democracy in this country, which gives workers a say in their work and gives them some control over their terms and conditions and their pay levels. We, again, are the second worst in Europe. Everybody else does this. Volkswagen, big successful company, hardly you call a, a failure. One third of their board is elected from among its employees. They recently had a look at a board meeting and they said, I don't know. The chief executive is getting carried away. We need to pull the salary back in. And that's what they did. They have compressed pay scales because they have industrial democracy. Now, um, there's no time here. I, I can talk about this in three hours. Um, there's so much that we can do. There's so much that we know how to do to address the issue of inequality equally. There's so much that we know how to do to fix our poxy, unproductive economy. What we have to do is support the development and the building of a new generation of productive industry. There's lots of things we can do to do that, but perhaps above all, we need a national investment bank, which doesn't take the private banking assumption that if I lend it at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and I haven't made a profit by half past five, that's a mistake. If we want to build factories, if we want to build manufacturing in this country, we need finance that says this is going to take five years, and we understand it. We don't have the banking system that's going to do that, so we're going to have to build it. We can and we know how. We need a proper industrial policy which says, nah, we're not just going to sit back and hope for the best. We're going to say that the people democratically have a right to have some opinion about their economy. The one thing you've been telling is that you weren't allowed. Only the markets can decide. No, it's not only the markets that can decide. If we want to create a manufacturing economy, there's things that we can do to make it happen. A quick example is stop using procurement policy to buy cheap stuff overseas and start building stuff in this country and buying it here. We can do that. It's entirely legal despite the things that we tell you. There's so much that we can do with industrial policy. Um, innovation rates, worker innovation rates are the most important. I don't think I've time to tell you about that just now. There's so much that we can do. We really can. We need an industrial policy. So when we get this right, we have an industrial policy that get, creates a good economy. A good economy creates good jobs. Good jobs make good taxes. Good taxes make strong public finances. Strong public finances make uh, excellent public services. And excellent public services make strong social cohesion. That's it. That's the Scotland we want. We call it Commonweal. Uh, Commonweal, uh, a 
Cairn Middle School, it's Cairn for Wellshire, the Common for the Common Wellbeing. A society that puts all this first. We know how to do it. We have everything. We are about to publish um, in a couple of weeks' time a fabulous thing with some, some youngsters. They're geniuses, I love these guys. They took Scotland and they've done an atlas of Scotland. 58 maps. And on each map they superimpose what we've got. There's a map that shows you where our wind speeds are. There's a map that shows you where our, our um, tidal currents are. There's a map that shows you where our productive land is. There's a map that shows you where our people are. There's a map that shows you our geostrategic position in the world. Map after map after map, you just look at it and you see, my God, this country's got everything we need. All this stuff this week about Sterling, all this stuff about where you better do is your tool we're not giving you. Giving us what? What in the hell is it that you think we need London? We're okay. We have everything that we need right here. We're ready to go. Stop patronising us. When you understand that we have that and it's sitting right in front of us, ready to get picked up, ready to get put together by us, and ready to get used, you'll start to feel a hell of a lot more confident about your future. And we should be more confident about our future. We are a country that is blessed, genuinely blessed. We have just got to make the decisions to run that country for us. We can do all the things that we should do. We can take energy back into collective ownership. We've got paper on that. It's very straightforward and very easy and it costs cost nothing. Um, we can just take energy back into collective ownership. We can become an entirely renewables focused industry, uh, country if we just put the money into creating a, a storage, an energy storage technology industry. It would create thousands, five thousand, ten thousand jobs. We can do all of these things. And anyone told you that we can be. Anyone that told you we're not capable of it hasn't sat down and looked at the facts, the figures, the economics, the ideas, the knowledge and the experience of people from other places. Now, this is what I'm doing nowadays. I, I know there's been quite a lot of productivity and technical jargon of what I'm seeing here. I only use it, I only say it because I go in town hall after town hall telling people, be confident, be certain and be sure that we're not kidding when we say that we can do this. We're going to publish probably in about... April, late April, early May, we're going to publish uh, one large manifesto which will explain start to finish how we transform this country from being one thing or another, from that me first country to that all of us first country. We can do this. All you have to do is look, understand, want it and take it. It is this close. We are this close. We just have to reach out and grab this country. All we have to do is vote yes. See how that is. I thought I might try without a microphone. How does it sound without a mic? No, I need it. <laughs> right, okay, we'll go for it. Yeah, so uh, Michelle Thompson, now, being very honest here, this is a, a new departure for me. All this kind of stuff about talking about independence. I describe myself as always uh, politically aware, never politically active, but I personally just felt it was so important this opportunity that Scotland has to. For me to stand up and say, I'm here, I want to be counted. Because by doing that, myself, my community, my colleagues, I give permission to other people as well. And for too long, in my opinion, too many people have sat by and accepted things. So please forgive me, I'm nowhere near as polished as that, uh, all the information that Robin uh, gave you there. I'll just tell you a wee bit about me though. When I was growing up, I was very comfortable with the knowledge, the words that was used around too wee, too poor, too stupid. That was part of the consciousness that I grew up with. After a while, I probably even stopped noticing it when I got ma married. My father-in-law just said that to me because we started talking about politics. And I think if anything, this is a time for us to say, what? That is absolutely ridiculous and most ridiculous of all is that our fellow Scots of a certain generation still use that language. How's about that for a lack of confidence? Confidence is something that I think Robin was alluding to. Yes, we do need to be confident. And to be confident, we need to understand that confidence is about making a choice. When I was growing up, my father got me a job as a trainee clerkess. He was, he was fair chuffed with himself, got your job, got your job. I was actually quite irritated with him that that was the scope of his ambition for me. And I said, no, no, no I'm not going to go and do that, I want to do something different. 
And at the time I had to say, no, I'm not going to do it. I had to have a level of self-confidence. And this is what we need to do just now. It's so important. So having confidence is about making a choice. Looking at this debate just now, one of the things I realised is just how deep the chasm is between the No Campaign and ourselves, where they actively market, because I'm involved in various businesses, that the UK is okay. Well, whoop de do. Who's going to jump up and down to that strap line? UK, okay. Is that the best that they can come up with? It's absolutely unbelievable. And I tell you what, I want a lot more than okay for my family, for my future, for my fellow citizens. Absolutely outrageous. And of course, part of this okay is, oh, but by the way, have we told you about more cuts and more austerity? But we'll have lots more people in the House of Lords as well, so that it's even bigger than the two houses in the United, uh, in the United States and the European Parliament. Completely ridiculous. So if we could choose, if we could choose a whole manner of things, why wouldn't we? If we could choose to set out the framework for our future in a constitution that enshrines the rights of all Scots, Regardless of colour, creed, sexuality, why wouldn't we choose to do that? Why wouldn't we choose allowing the sovereign people of Scotland to make these choices and set out what we want? If we could choose to have a mature democracy where the government that we elect actually represents our interests, why wouldn't we do that? If we could choose not to have child poverty that is similar to some third world countries, why wouldn't we choose that? If we could have choose to have our values represented in our civic society, why wouldn't we choose that? If we could choose quality jobs, quality jobs, not low paid, the sort of thing Robin was talking about, why wouldn't we choose to make that happen? If we could choose to get rid of weapons of mass destruction right next door to our biggest city. Why wouldn't we choose that? If we could choose to get rid of taxes like the bedroom tax, why wouldn't we choose that? So let's look at some of these things around too poor, too stupid, too weak. Too poor. Well, let's remind ourselves. So we know from the government ga gathered figures that we get less tax back than we raise in Scotland. So every year, we quite happily hand over money and get less of it back. What's that about? Mm -hmm. We know that even today, based on the figures, this is from Jer, so we would be the eighth wealthiest country in the world, as compared to the UK, it's 16th. And I would point out as well that these figures exclude things like that, that is uh, gathered by Westminster, so it would probably be even more so. In terms of deficit, yes, the UK has a deficit, but Scotland's deficit is less than that of the UK. And of course, we are paying ridiculous amounts of interest on debt. In the last 30 years alone, we've paid £64.1 billion pounds of interest on debt. And incidentally, when you look at our bottom line figures, it was money we didn't need to borrow in the first place. So too poor? No, don't think so. How about the two we then? Actually, Scotland's a medium-sized country. And when you look at the top 10 wealthiest countries in the world, only two of them, Australia and America, are very large. All the rest are the typical smaller North European countries, Luxembourg, Sweden and so on, Switzerland I should have said. So how about the two stupid then? And sometimes you can forget when you're surrounded by some of the stuff we hear in, in the media, how brilliant Scotland has been in shaping the world. Medicine, education, life sciences, economics, economists. Look at uh, Carney, the recent uh, lunch there, which I was very fortunate to attend. He specifically mentioned one economist, and that was Merrilies, who chaired the Fiscal Commission working, uh, working Group. So, and of course we had a recent prize winner, the Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize as well. So what's this independence about to me? Uh, I'm no truck with this term, ridiculous about separatism. It's, of course, fundamentally it's hard about separation. 
Yes, there's plans for a, a monarchy union, a currency union, I'm sure we'll come on to that later. Social unions will continue. And of course, as a geographical landmass, Britain's not going anywhere. <laughs> Don't be fooled by this kind of talk, this sweet talk that we know is going to come our way from the UK parties around Devil Max, Devil Plus, Devil with knobs on. Let's just remind ourselves, so the Calman Commission that was set up in 2007 and delivering its final things via the Scotland Act takes is a meteoric rise from only 7% control over our fiscal levers to 15%. In other words, 85% still rests with Westminster. And that's taken from 2007 to allow us to introduce a different sort of standard to the land tax and so on. No, it's nowhere good enough. And of course, we actually have such a significant responsibility here because many of the problems faced, to my mind, by Scotland are faced by many other areas of the UK. The Westminster system of government is fundamentally broken. It needs absolutely significant change. We are doing the rest of the UK a favour. Things must stop, they must change. And I think that would trigger positive change <coughs> in other areas of the UK and incidentally in political parties as well. Everyone's just stuttering along blindly. It cannot carry on like this. And of course, there's roughly about 150 countries that have become independent since the end of the Second World War. And none of them have asked to go back. They can do it, so why can't we? So, taking words from Nicola Sturgeon, who spoke at the SNP conference, her words, which I thought were great, was Scotland should be an independent country, Scotland could be an independent country, Scotland must be an independent country. Thank you. feel as if there's nothing else for me to say now that long introduction, but I wanted to thank John Mulvey for these kind of remarks and to thank the Edinburgh North and Leith Yes Scotland campaign for inviting me to speak and above all I wanted to thank you for coming because I'm sure from our point of view the top table and the organisers without you as an audience this would be a meeting. So it's very important that you're here and it's a very important debate that Scotland is currently engaged in and so it's all credit for you. All credit to you for engaging in that debate. And I would ask you to make no mistake about this debate. This isn't just a debate about how you'll vote on September the 18th, Thursday, September the 18th. It's not just a vote for independence for Scotland. It's a vote against the neoliberal agenda, economic model and the warmongering agenda that has been foisted on Scotland by Westminster, Whitehall and the City of London for decades. That's the context of this debate and I think it's clearly that important. And as Robin and Michelle have made clear, the Yes Scotland campaign, all of us, we intend to establish a social democratic alternative to all that because that's what the majority of people in Scotland want to see. And Scotland, as my colleagues have said, is one of the richest countries in the world. We want to see that great wealth that Scotland generates distributed far more fairly, far more evenly than has ever been the case before. And frankly, that means that communities like this one in North Edinburgh and the one I live in in South Edinburgh get a far fairer share and a far greater percentage of that wealth than we've ever seen before. That's what this debate's about. That's what the independence debate is about. And I want to make one thing clear to you at the very beginning before I go any further. Supporting the democratic right of nations like Scotland to self-determination doesn't make you a Scottish nationalist. It makes you a democrat. Because it's a democratic right that the people of Scotland are entitled to have. We just want to be an independent free country in the same way the 200 and up, 260 other independent free countries in the world line up. That's all. No favours, no lottery winners, no prizes for guessing that I was connected to Copenhagen. None like that. We just want whatever the else takes for granted. And I'm a trade unionist and a socialist, proud of it, who supports independence. And the distinction that I would want to make clear, I stand here in the traditions of John McLean, 
hundred years ago, the leader of the Red Clydesiders in the west of Scotland. And the same tradition as James Connolly, perhaps the greatest, most famous socialist ever produced by this city. And John McLean and James Connolly would never ever have described themselves as nationalists. But both of them were passionate advocates of an independent Scotland. And that's the noble, honourable tradition that I stand in. And I, I often watch the debate, you know the Winter Olympics is on just now. Just as we had with the Summer Olympics last year or the year before, whatever year it was. <laughs> and you're reminded of all the mistakes these commentators make. They ought to be reminded that Scotland is a nation. We're a country. We're not a region or a province of anywhere else. We're not a region or a province of Britain. And we're damn sure not a region or a province of England. We're a country. We're a nation. And we're entitled as a nation to be free and independent if that's what we want. And so this debate here is a very important one and it's my job tonight, I suppose, to put in front of you the democratic and indeed the social democratic case for independence. And put simply, that means that not communities like yours in North Edinburgh and in South Edinburgh, working class communities across the length and breadth of Britain, we'll be better off that's why we support independence. The working class majority in this country will be better off economically, will be better off socially, and will be better off politically. And that's what I want to focus my remarks upon. Now, as Michelle Robin have read made clear, Britain is the eighth richest country in the world, according to the OECD, the, the Organisation of Economic Cooperation and Development. So they are the people who should know. They're the ones who draw up the league table. And they have Scotland with the ownership of our oil and gas reserves as the eighth richest country in the world. And like all the other rich countries in the world, we are a wealthy country because our economy is diverse. Yes, we have oil and gas, but we don't just have oil and gas. We have renewable energy that now provides a third of our electricity. We have profitable financial services sector, a lot of it based in this city. We've got a manufacturing base, a construction industry, a food and drinks industry, a whisky industry that's never been more lucrative. We've got creative industries. We've got a public sector that produces highly skilled, educated and talented workforce. And by the way, the people, that highly talented and educated workforce are our most precious resource and our greatest gift. And I only mention this list, not to bore the pants off you, but to rebut the charge that's put by the other side that somehow Scotland is some economic basket case, that we couldn't look after ourselves, that we'd end up eating porridge and drinking whiskey and that would be our life. That's what they argued in 1979. That's what they argued then, Scotland is too wee, too stupid, and we eat porridge and drink whiskey. And the fact is, it now stands to reason that if all the taxes you paid, all your income tax, all your national insurance contributions, all your VAT, all the duty you pay in petrol, all the taxes you pay in booze and tobacco, all the corporation tax and capital gains tax, all those taxes that we pay in Scotland stayed here instead of being siphoned off by the UK Treasury in London, then it stands to reason we'd be better off. We'd have a damn sight more money at our disposal than we have currently. Scotland raises £50 billion pounds a year in these taxes and duties. And the budget for Fiona and the Scottish Parliament, 33, 34 billion. So we're 17 billion pounds short somewhere that they owe us. And if, if, for me, when you look at these figures, the thing that cries out is, what could we be doing with that extra revenue? What could we be doing with the extra 17 billion pound that they take out of us? Leaving aside the North Sea oil and the other industries that would come to us, that we would own. And I look around North Edinburgh. I go across the length and breadth of Scotland at these meetings, I'm sure my colleagues do too. And I'm horrified, quite frankly, that Scotland, the eighth richest country in the world in the 21st century, that there's one in three children in North Edinburgh and in Glasgow and elsewhere in this country in dire need, in poverty. That's an outrage. It's an outrage that there's one in three households in Scotland today, the 13th of February 2014, living in fuel poverty. It's an outrage that there are pensioners who don't get to live in retirement and dignity. It's an outrage that in the 21st century, 
We've now seen the equivalent of the soup kitchens for the 1930s by people getting packets of beans, packets of rice, packets of noodles handed out to them in food parcels in Scotland in the 21st century. People say to me, what's this debate about? That's what this debate's about. That's what it's about. We have the power to bring that to an end. And by Christ, I intend to seize it. And you have to too. We've got the opportunity to eradicate the scourge of low pay in this city. <coughs> Edinburgh, the second richest city in Britain. Tens of thousands of people barely surviving in work, in poverty. We've got underemployment in this city. We get parts of this city as poor as anywhere you'll find in Scotland. Poor as anywhere you'll find in Britain. And it's the second richest city in Britain. And those kind of inequalities, I think, we rightly see as an affront and we want to bring them to an end. So we'll be socially better off because we at long last get the chance to address these inequalities. We get a chance to address the chronic shortage of affordable housing in this city, amongst the many other things that we face. That's what independence gives us the chance to address, and I'm damn sure I'm going to make every effort I can to address it. And the political advantage we had, I mentioned we'll be economically better off, we'll be socially better off independence, and we'll be politically better off under independence, because when we decide on September the 18th to an independent Scotland, there'll be no more David Camerons. There'll be no more Tory governments. people into indignified employment. That's what we intend to change and independence gives us that opportunity because working class people in Scotland are held back by the union. And as my colleagues have said, Robin pointed it quite rightly too, of course it isn't it? Vote for yes and keep the status quo. I'm afraid not. I bring you the bad news. As Ed Willaband himself announced just on Tuesday, even the election of a Labour government there will be austerity implemented when that Labour government comes to power. More cuts in public services, more attacks on welfare rights, more attacks on immigrants and claimants holding names scapegoated for crimes created by the bankers. So it isn't just the status quo, it's worse and worse and worse. They've taken the trouble to warn you what is coming down the line. You should at least tease that warnings. And I want to say this to you finishing, John. The Labour Party of Margaret Curran one of the spokespersons for Better Together is fond of saying that Scotland gets the best of both worlds because we have a strong parliament, as she says, and vital influence in the UK. Well, I have to say to you, after 10 years at Holyrood, you'd have thought Margaret Curran would have learned something. Because the truth of the matter is, Holyrood does not have strong powers. It has very limited powers. That's the whole point of this debate. The powers that Holyrood have are insufficient for what we want to see addressed. I was an MP representing your good selves in the Lodians for four years at Holyrood. And we were there, as Fiona's tip, as I'm sure is told today, we're constantly told about what we can't talk about. Colin, you can't talk about unemployment. Colin, you can't talk about industrial relations. Colin, you can't talk about low pay in the Scottish Parliament. You can't talk about the economy. You can't talk about... Soldiers, laddies and lassies for this city dying in Iraq and Afghanistan. You can't talk about the obscenity of tribe because they are no for you. They are for another place. That's for the grown-ups to talk about. You don't get to talk about that. In other words, we could you talk about the things that Mark and Stickens came to see me every Friday. How can you talk about that in the Parliament? So we don't have a Parliament with the powers that we need. And neither do we have influence in the UK Parliament, because if we did, the vast majority is in Scotland, and you went the bedroom tax. We got lumber beer. We didn't want the Royal Mail to be privatised. We got lumber beer. We didn't want the second generation of trident nuclear weapons. Didn't even want the first ones. But we get lumbered with them. That's the truth. We don't have any influence at Westminster. And truth is, independence gives us those powers at long last. No more Tory governments. None of those policies. No more destruction of our manufacturing base. And I have to say to you, I'm the national spokesperson of the Scottish Socialist Party. For me, independence gives working class people the chance to change our lives profoundly. I'm a socialist, I'm for an independent socialist Scotland. 
I'm in favour of a modern, democratic republic for Scotland. I believe the people of this country should be sovereign. We should have an elected, accountable, representative head of state. I believe in all these <coughs> things and more. My time's up. I would tell you about them if I had more time. But the truth is, none of that is possible without a yes vote on September the 18th. And I have to say, I'm confident that we're going to win on September the 18th. I'm confident about it. Because... Independence, the yes choice, is the progressive choice in this referendum. And people in Scotland have got a habit, a tradition, of taking that progressive choice. And my prediction? My prediction is, by the 13th of February next year, you won't be able to find anybody who voted no. <laughs> remember 1979, which is 35 years ago, and a woman called Mrs. Thatcher got elected in 1979. By 1980, you couldn't find anybody who'd voted for her. She was that hated. Nobody would own up to it. And my view is, in a year from now, you won't find anybody who's prepared to admit that they voted no, because yes is the obvious option. We'll be standing in a year's time going, of course it was the right thing to do. Of course we were right to choose our own future. We're going to win. And you want to make sure that when we do win, you can turn to John Mulvey and me and Michelle and Robin and Fiona and say, I did that. I did that. We did that collectively. We changed Scotland forever. We changed the world. Thank you very much for your time. Right, who on the panel wants to kick off with Plan B? I'll, I'll, I'll start with that. Yeah. Um, the, the Scottish Government, when it was establishing the White Paper, set up the, a fiscal commission. Fiscal commission was populated by international economists, including two uh, Nobel Laureate Prize winners, one of whom is a, a guy called Jim Mirrlees, uh, referred to by Michelle Thompson. Now, they looked at four different scenarios. They looked at the euro and discounted. They looked at sterling. They looked at a Scottish currency pegged to sterling. And they looked, like, they looked at a flexible Scottish currency. Now, they said in terms of the economic capability of Scotland, you know, we could deliver uh, any of those options. But the preferred option was the shared currency union of the rest of the United Kingdom. And, you know, people can agree or disagree, but that's what they recommended. Um, interesting, Jim Merrill has got an article in Today's Scotsman setting that out. When Mark Carney, the Governor of the Bank of England, came to, to Scotland, he quoted two economists that had inspired him, Adam Smith and also Jim Mirrlees. And in terms, therefore, of the, the advice that we've had from the experts, that's what their recommendations, not just for Scotland, but for the rest of the UK. Why do I think that George Osborne's campaign rhetoric, because I think that's what it is today, will start to unravel from his perspective? In terms of uh, exports from the rest of the United Kingdom to Scotland, the value is £59 billion. Pounds. It's going to cost English and Welsh businesses half a billion pounds for the, the announcement that he's just made just there. And in terms of the strength of it, in, in terms of the strength of the pound, it is underpinned by the revenue and the, the, the capability that we have in North Sea uh, oil and uh, gas to the tune of 30 billion pounds. So if you take that out, you're taking out a huge hole in their balance of trade. And so therefore the emphasis and, and the focus on that decision he's made will start to come and impact on him. And why do I think that's going to happen? Well, just a couple of weeks ago, you'll have noticed that Danny Alexander announced that the UK government was going to acknowledge to the markets that the £1.3 trillion worth of debt legally issued to the UK government would be the responsibility of the UK government. Now, we're also responsible. We think we should share assets and liabilities, and that includes servicing the debt. But also with servicing the debt and taking our responsibility, we have the share of the assets. And the Bank of England is as much our asset as it is the rest of the UK. Now, will there be negotiations? Of course, there'll be a whole range of negotiations that will take place. But a Westminster government in campaign mode uh, no now will be different than the state day one after a yes vote. And then finally, um, so therefore there are, as in, the, the, in terms of your points, are there other options? Well, the Fiscal Commission looked at the other options and have recommended and provided advice in each of them. So that's already laid out. And finally, because I'll, I'll answer number three as well on the independent constitution. 
Uh, we think there should be a constitution written by the people. Uh, the, one of the travesties of the British state is there is no written constitution. And one of the proudest moments of my life was in July last year, when I was invited by the descendants of the authors of the American Declaration of Independence to speak in Independence Hall on the 4th of July. And what a moment that was. And imagine doing that in an independent Scotland, written by the Scots for the Scots. And I think that has to be as open and as inclusive as possible. And, and I think that's also about shaping and forming a new nation. It's not just about getting a yes vote. It's about what we shape and form. And a written constitution will be very much part and parcel of that new Scotland. Thanks. Uh, anybody else on plan B? Yeah, because I, I don't agree with the Scottish Government position. Um, and I don't re I mean, the Fiscal Commission was strategic rather than, than policy, in my view. We work with a lot of economists developing these proposals. And most of the people who want to build the Progressive Scotland would say, Sterling, if we have it, should not be for long. We should be transitioning to another currency. There's actually still some case to say that maybe in five years the euro might be an option. I rather doubt it. What I would do straight away is begin with the clear point, and I haven't got time to go into this. I've been blogging personally on this one in Come On Scotland, cmonscotland.org. You can go and have a look at this in some more detail. Our negotiations are made so easy. There's a simple principle of negotiation. If the other side wants more than you do, you set the terms. And the thing that we've not been saying properly in Scotland is that the rest of the UK has nothing we really want. Sterling, maybe. Apart from that, we could go away now. We could just head off. We have everything we need. On the other hand, they are absolutely desperate for us to take some share of the debt. Yeah. Now, Scotland will not be taking any share of the debt, and it's important that people understand this. We will make an agreement to send them down some aid payments. Yeah. I believe that was... <laughs> Payments. I think we should maybe question whether we give it direct to London. I'm actually quite in favour of saying, why don't we send it to the north of England, Wales, yeah. Cornwall, yeah. yeah. But, just a technical point. They decided to reject international precedent on, on, on the separation of states. They said Scotland is not a continuing state, we lose all our rights. Okay, that's fine. Um, actually, in some ways, that's a good thing. But we're not a, we're not a um, successor state when it suits in a continuing state when it doesn't. There is no default. We can walk away. And if it wasn't for the fact that I'm a highly moral person and don't want to leave my comrades in England and Wales uh, and Northern Ireland screwed, we would just go. We would just go with no debt. There will be no, it's not a default. There will be no credit market reaction. We will borrow money with no difficulty. We have to say this over and over again. We have lots of things that they want. They have nothing we want. Feel confident about that. What I think we should probably do, though, is um, just go straight away, convert a large chunk of the make them be unreasonable about sterling, convert a large chunk of the debt immediately into foreign exchange currency, create the Scottish pound, and use the foreign exchange um, fund to peg it to sterling. So it'll be the same name, it'll look the same, and it'll have the same value, but we control it. Uh, that's what we should do. On jobs, I want to give a very, very quick analogy. Imagine that you wanted to get things built and you're in a, a nursery school. So you're running a nursery school and you want to get stuff built. What would you do? Would you let the biggest kids shove the other kids out of the way and hoard the Lego? No, because they wouldn't build any. They'd just hoarding and grabbing and shoving becomes the game. That's the British economy. If you wanted to get your wings to build stuff, you spread the Lego more evenly. Some will hoard, lots will build. Now, that's how you get stuff built. Very roughly, that's how we create jobs in this country. At the moment, we let all of our income, all of our wealth, all of our equity, all of our capital be held by a tiny number, number of multinational corporations. They only use that money to extract wealth from us. What we need to do is to create an economy which creates the wealth. That's what creates the jobs. To do that, what we have to have is much more local business, local trade and local uh, manufacture, as well as export manufacture. So what you've got to do is fundamentally change the economy. We have high unemployment problems because of our economic model. If you look at anyone that follows the kind of model that we are talking about, the Nordic countries, they don't have that problem because the they're, they're productive because the public sector, which is strong because of tax stake, can create a lot of jobs too. And just very quickly on constitution, I, I, I'm delighted about the constitution. I think it's a great thing. I'm actually not a constitutional geek. I, I get very disappointed. People get really disappointed about this when I answer this question. I'm not really that fussed. I'm a, I get old Presbyterian school. I hang you up in the morning, you work hard, you go to bed and you start again. Yeah. The idea that you can get a constitution, write it and switch autopilot, a lot of people have kind of got that in their head. I don't think it's true. 
but I think it's still a wonderful game that we have it. I think it's a wonderful thing that we can write as a nation. And the only thing that I would like to see is just a reminder to political elites now and forever. I would have the first words in our constitution just state, um, the state and the government are an agreement between its citizens. So long as the citizens support that state, it continues, and so long as they don't, it doesn't. And, but beyond that, to be quite honest, like I say, my focus is from, I'm not going to say September 19th, because I expect to be hung over for at least three days, but so, <laughs> certainly early October. My focus is, is really about saying, this is great, now we've got the powers, let's build the active and participative democracy that delivers. Um, and there are some wonderful constitutional people who work in the Constitution. Point to add to that in terms of the, the, the sterling zone, there will be a currency union. As far as I was concerned, what George Osborne was saying today is just <coughs> politics. He's playing a game, he's relying on the fact, yes, scaremongering that uh, most people won't have considered it very carefully. I mean, the reasons, as Robin says, for them are utterly compelling. The UK is actually, well, we're already in a currency zone. Um, we're already in a currency union, rather, and the, the reasons are utterly uh, compelling, some of which Fiona mentioned. But he, he talked about stability and commerce, and given this kind of focus on commerce, why would you endanger the level of trade that Scotland does with England when you're talking about £5 billion pounds per month, which we calculate around 700,000 jobs are dependent on? Why would you take out £40 billion from Scotland's share, the, the balance of payments, why would you introduce additional transaction costs around 500 million a month? It just doesn't make sense. It's politicking. And as Fiona says, I mean, the, the moves from the, the UK Treasury around the debt, I, I wondered today whether he'd been bounced into that position. Strategically, I think it's a significantly wrong move for them because it gives us seven and a half months to quash and get the facts back on the table around the scaremongering. But obviously, I'm delighted they've chosen to make that move. I think it serves us very well. In terms of jobs, to my mind, from my perspective, we're not talking about replacing a Westminster system and putting it in Edinburgh. What we tend to forget in Scotland is that 99.3% of our businesses are SMEs and 98.3% of them are small businesses, another 0 to 49 people. And we've got systems here, we've got very inefficient tax systems. As soon as a business gets half good, it's immediately clobbered with VAT. I mean, it's almost like virtually impossible to get out of the bit. And we've tended to look at business very much in the prism of the kind of multinationals, the big kind of global companies. And in reality, that's not what, what Scotland's about. So there's lots of things with the, these additional fiscal levers that we can do. We'll probably be spoilt for choice and actually the, the questions will be what are the immediate things that will make a real difference and a real significant difference. In terms of the constitution, I, I disagree uh, with Robin here, I actually think that's really important because to my mind what I said earlier on about confidence, we have suffered from a chronic lack of confidence, particularly people of a, a certain age that have been brought up to believe something, setting out a constitution that states and that the people all of us have the chance to contribute to and engage in is in a very, very important marker to me about setting, around, setting out the values and principles that we believe in and that we'll adhere to as the sovereign people of Scotland. I just think it's incredibly important because that's something living, breathing that will stay with us and sets out our stall and differentiates us from this kind of madness that we've been in as part of the, the UK. Yeah, can I just say, first of all, to thank the gentleman for his question, because to be honest, a meeting like this that didn't discuss that issue, there'd been an elephant in the room, wouldn't there? It? It's right that we discuss it. This is the big issue of the moment. And I have to say to you, does anybody smell cordite? Does anybody smell gunpowder? Because that's what today was. It was the firing of a gun by George Osborne. And I have to say to you, George Osborne comes to the Point Hotel this morning at 9 o'clock, and he tells the people of Scotland that you can't use the pound. Mm -hmm. And the people of Scotland's reply at nine o'clock is, try stopping us. <laughs> no posh boy from London is going to come up here and tell us what we can and can't do because you weren't bred for it, pal. <laughs> we'll do what we decide as right to do. And I say this to you, I think there's the question of incident. This is clearly about economics and military policy, but it's also, let me be absolutely clear about it, this is naked politics. This is 13th of February. Why does it come the day 
Why today, to the point of tale, at nine o'clock in the morning? Do you think it's in to do with the fact that the last six opinion polls, one after another, showed that the Yes campaign has taken a 5% lead out of Alistair Darling's backside? That's why he's here. It's because they're terrified. They're terrified enough to say right from the beginning, I won't allow anybody here to underestimate these people. Don't underestimate them. They are fighting for their privileges. They are fighting for their rights. They are fighting for their chance and their right, as they see it, to control our lives. Don't judge them that there's some pushover. They are going to throw everything at us in the next seven months and we should be ready for it. And I was ready for today. And I have to say to you, it's more about politics than it is about monetary policy. But unless the question I think is that we're ducking the issue, my feeling is that the position that the Yes campaign has argued that we want a sterling zone, that's a transitional arrangement to make sure that we move from the 18th of September to the 19th of September. Trading. You know, the economy's in the same position. There are plenty of things that we're going to change. But I have, I have to say, like Robin and others, I believe that it's a transitional arrangement that we move too quickly. Another arrangement, a more profound arrangement, where we have our own currency that gives us the power to control our own monetary and fiscal time that we are good and ready for it. And I think that's the conclusion to draw it today. Two quick things. I think the question you asked is really important. My daughter's just gone to Edinburgh University. She's at Liberton High School. Not quite. That last June, I go to the price given there's 30, 40 of them. They're all leaving. And, and of course, well, you know, John Telger was born 1959, so you know I'm more than 21. Anyway, I remember when I was at school, at Motherwell, a ladies high school in Motherwell, and on an occasion like that, everybody was going to work. There was jobs for everybody in the steel industry. The Royal Bank of Scotland used to take on thousands of tellers at the end of the school term. There was the tax centre, there was the council, there was the civil service. There was jobs for everybody. My daughter left Liberton High School. Not one of them was going to work. Not one of them. There was the jobs for any of them. And I tell you what, anybody here, don't allow anybody to tell you. Kids the day have got it easy. No Your way. arse. No way. They're harder now grown up than it's ever been before. Because these are kids that are no jobs to go to. What happens, they go to college and university and offset the time when they try to get a job. And youngsters who leave school with no qualifications in this city face an absolutely terrible prospect because as bad as it is the jobs market, there's 50,000 students in the city who have to work to get through university and college and they're taken on before the school leavers. It's murder. So I'll tell you what the answer is. I'm a socialist. I believe in full employment, the right to work in the Constitution. Everybody should have the right to work. The left always believed in that. It's not as if there's not plenty of jobs today. Look at around you. Look at the elderly care centres. No enough staff. Look at the shops you go to. When you're queuing up, no enough staff to serve you. We look around the city. There's not enough people working. There's plenty of jobs to be done. And independence is about saying there's plenty of jobs to be done. We're going to allocate the work to ensure that everybody's got a job. And on top of that, in case you think that's just enough, no, we have to eradicate poverty wages. Poverty wages. We should have a living wage that goes along with that job. A living wage that people are not working for less than £9 an hour in this city. You can't pay your rent. You can't pay your bills with less than £9 an hour. And that's what I'm about. Constitution for you. A constitution that should be written. What's in it? Your right to a job, yeah. your right to a house, your right to education, your right not to be in fuel poverty, your right to equality. We look around the world as Robin and his colleagues have done, I'll tell you what day, 21st century. We'll send Robin and Fiona and Michelle around the world, they'll stay at home. We'll send them around the world <laughs> and they'll look for best practice. Best practice in other countries in the world with their constitutions and bring it back and say in New Scotland, the newest country in the world, the best constitution in the world. We're going to copy what the people do right in places elsewhere in the world and we're going to ditch the rubbish. That's the Scotland to live in, eh? Yeah. Okay, quickly, on the banks, casinos, etc. Who's going to want to catch and take a shot at uh, could, could you try and... Simply, quickly. Tell us what your answer to that. Okay, um, you said, uh, I can't remember who asked all the questions. 
You asked the question, um, we were unable to know, we chose not to regulate the banks. Um, getting the banking right is one of the key things that we've got to do. We'll have a paper, we, we, I should have said at the beginning, we've had about 20 major policy papers out, we've got another 40 coming, we'll pull them all together. In the banks, um, there's a couple of models that we could use, but basically we've got to take RBS and break it up. Um, we've got to take the retail part of RBS and break it up into a regional banking system. We've got to take the investment bit and punt it, do what we want with it and dump the other stuff, and use some of the assets to create a, a national investment bank. We could actually do that in negotiations. If we're negotiating on assets, and I'm not sure we should be, um, we can just walk away. But if we're negotiating on assets, we could take RBS for about £7 billion and, and the gold reserves, and we'd have more value of that on its asset books. Um, but the key thing is that... Um, I, this is one of the areas where I don't agree with white paper. We need a different regulatory system. We can't have the UK banking regulatory system. It's not safe. The first thing we've got to do is smaller banks, and so we don't have to have lender of last resort. Lender of last resort is what is, happens when you have systemic risk, when you have a number of massive banks who are all so closely linked to each other that one goes the all go. If an investment bank goes bust, that's their call. If a retail bank goes bust, we should defend the savings of the people in it, not necessarily the bank, and we should never have a systemic risk by having any big banks too big. It is so easy to fix that one. Um, but it, it, I have no idea. I don't know if anyone knows the real meaning of populism. Everyone thinks that populism is when the SNP government does something genuinely good, like getting rid of tuition fees, and that's supposed to be populist. That's popular, completely different thing. Populism is based not on the root word popular, but on the root word populist. It's a political doctrine which divides societies into a big bit and a wee bit, and it makes the big bit hate the wee bit, so the big bit doesn't hate the elite that's running the show. Um, populism was reintroduced... Reintroduced into Britain by Margaret Thatcher. That was her game. Um, it's, been, it's never really gone away since, but it's been ramped up since the financial crisis. Whenever there's a financial crisis, the elite tried to make everyone blame somebody weak. One of the reasons I want independent Scotland is because we can have an end of populism, an end of populist politics, and we can get rid of that dynamic altogether. We do not have to say our people against each other to let a rich elite at the hook. So that we can do that in Scotland. The media is awful. It's terrible. You don't know how bad the media is. Yes. I'm a professional. I've worked in it for sure. years, and I don't see this lightly. Um, we have the worst media uh, of any nation I am aware of, of any developed nation I'm aware of. There is no diversity, and there's out-and-out out propaganda run daily. I will defend the BBC a bit, and that's going to get me a boo. I'll defend the BBC a bit. No. The BBC is not perfect, but I think we forget what it's like when you don't have something like the BBC. Get yourself over to Berlusconi's Italy, and then you'll see what it looks like. So let's not be overly hard on the BBC, but let's just get some pressure on them to do better. Okay, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> adding to the booze on behalf of the BBC, I think there is one thing that we could do, is that any time, whether it's radio or television, we see this institution which we all pay for, uh, is, is acting in an a, a uneven-handed manner, which frankly, in my opinion, uh, has been doing so since this campaign for independence started. We uh, tried to expose it by putting pressure on the, the BBC elite, they came in on what, but at least it, you've got a basis for doing it, uh, it should be accessible, you pay their salaries, a lot of them well-stuffed salaries as well. Uh, so that's one thing you can do as far as the press is concerned, the media is concerned. Like, clearly, that's one of the issues that's going to be slightly uphill for us between the September, now in September, because there's only one newspaper in Scotland that is openly supportive of the Yes campaign, and that's, that's a difficulty that we have to acknowledge. On the press, or...? No, no, I, I just want to just... I know there's five questions, I'll just answer two <laughs> and save your time. On, on the question of the bankers that was raised, I, I think this is the greatest injustice of our age. The banks bankrupted this country in 2007 and 2008. Tens of billions of pounds, astronomical sums of money, public money, were used to bail them out. And what's happened is that the political classes at Westminster are holding claimants, they're holding the poor, they're holding working class communities to account for crimes held by the bankers. Mm -hmm. It's the greatest miscarriage of justice of our time. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, I, I believe, I, I don't ever describe myself as a politician, by the way, I'm a freedom fighter. But politicians, yeah. politicians are now second bottom of the league table of people they don't like. Bankers are at the bottom. <laughs> they're hated and they're rightly hated. And I remember the bankers when you see them, and let me make one distinction. 
When I say bankers, I don't mean people who work for the banks. No. Banking staff, they're not to blame for hee haw. No. These are people who are getting hammered. The wages for people who work in the Bank of Scotland, the Royal Bank of Scotland, Clydesdale, my God, they're, they're, they're abominable. The bankers, I'm talking about the ones who take all the big decisions on the economy, these are the ones who think that the masters of the universe, isn't it? That's how they describe themselves. Masters of the universe. Too big to jail, they'll say. Too big to jail. I remember when I was an MSP, I was invited as Fiona, as probably you'll understand, MSPs get invited to meet all the high knobs in Edinburgh. And, and so I get invited to this meeting at the City Chambers. City Chambers? So I'm at the City Chambers with all the MSPs, and who's there but Sir Jeremy Peat? This guy was the Chief Economist at the Royal Bank of Scotland. And his job to get all the MSPs and the Lodians together, Fiona might have been there, I can't remember, was, wasn't he looking at Fiona, I was looking at Sir Jeremy. And Sir Jeremy does this great presentation in 2004. Isn't it marvellous? The Royal Bank of Scotland, the world's most profitable bank, the world's biggest company, isn't it marvellous that we're based here in Edinburgh? Shouldn't you be all so proud in that? And he gave this presentation about how great they were, etc. And I remember, it was going to question and answers, just the way John does, and I remember knowing that as the only socialist in the room, I wasn't going to get to ask a question, in all likelihood. So I'll go in first, just in that pregnant pause, who's going to be first? I'll be first! So I say to Sir Jeremy, Sir Jeremy, I'm Colin Fox, the Scottish Socialist Party's MSP for the Lothians, what would you say about the Royal Bank of Scotland being taken into public ownership and all those profits that you make? We build houses and schools and jobs for people. And Sir Jeremy, I remember looking round the room and going, I don't think that's going to happen. Oh. Well, it did happen, but the difference was it was nationalised when it was bankrupt. Yeah. We nationalised its losses. I'm in favour of the banks being taken into public ownership and the profits that are made build houses, schools, jobs for people, elderly care, and we make sure that everybody's got a living wage. That's the answer to the banking crisis. That would be the way to undo the great mis just, uh, miscarriage of our time, wouldn't it? Make the banks do something good for a change instead of pounding us every day of the week for extra money. And if I can say this, the other question I have to answer is the gentleman's asked there about immigrants. And I, and I have to say, I, I, I'm petrified about the debate down south. It's been poisoned for 25 years by the Daily Mail, the Daily Express, and all those who want to blame immigrants who come to this country for the country's problems. They're talking about their arse. Yes. The fact of the matter is, people who come to this country make this country wealthier as a consequence of coming here. The great tragedy is they make their own country poorer. And I'll tell you what, nobody in Scotland, not one of us here, will be told that these people are not brave, courageous people, because I've got family in Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, South Africa, America, so have you. And the idea that a hundred years ago they left Edinburgh and Glasgow and Motherwell to go and get jobs, and the idea that they were met at that end by people who talk the way they do about immigrants today in this country, send them back, take their jobs, they should go home. It horrifies and sickens me. And I'd like to think that Scotland's better than that. We lend a hand of friendship to people, and every single one of us have to ensure, promise me you'll ensure, that when the Poles, the Romanians, the Bulgarians, the young Spaniards who come here, promise me you'll work with that gentleman and others to make sure they don't get shot on. The horrible jobs, the horrible flats. So a question about paying for services, the question you raised here, anybody want to deal with that? Well, we more, we, we more than pay our own wages now in terms of paying for public services. We can do that in terms of our contribution, in terms of whether it's welfare or pensions, in terms of the national wealth of Scotland. So we're, we're perfectly capable of doing that and we continue to do that. How we distribute wealth, that will be for our future governments to determine how we do that. But I think in Scotland we'll do it in a far fairer way. But we do that by growing the wealth of the country so we can distribute it fairly. It's interesting, I've always got lost coming in because I come from West Lothian and I was going past Cramond and Barton and in this city you have cheap by jowl in a very small geographical area the differences between those who are wealthy and those who are not and I'm sure that will change but it's by taking all of Scotland up and that's how we can do that and distribute it. Uh, interest on the banking issue, um, you've seen both Barclays and indeed RBS saying this week that they will adapt to an independent Scotland and they will do business here. 
And I think there is an important point for this city, is one of the reasons we have a strong financial sector, it's not just the banks, it's the other areas that we have, insurance and also investment, is the quality of the staff here, the quality of the workforce here, and that is one of the strengths that we have going forward. In terms of um, the European question, currently the, Europe, the, the, the Parliament Committee has taken evidence to different lawyers, will take different things. However, we have been citizens of Europe for the last 40 years. We comply with the legislation. We implement the legislation. People will can make decisions about the future in the longer term. We think in the white paper that our membership of Europe brings jobs and services and protections, workers' rights and other aspects to Scotland that we think are welcome. In terms of what we can do, quote two people. So David Edwards is the only, only UK judge to have served in the European Court of Justice. And he thinks the proposition set out in Scotland's future about negotiating revised terms from within continuing membership is doable, as does Sir Graham Avery, who was one of the negotiators for the UK within the European Union. So it can be done, it's reasonable. <coughs> nobody, nobody thinks Scotland is going to be suddenly out of Europe. Uh, it's in everybody's interest to make sure we're still there and we're still part and contributing. So that's the answer on, on, on that area as to can we and will be. And the answer is yes, we can. There are different routes, we're not saying it has to be. <coughs> But we think that's the best route to do it. And it is getting uh, a reasonable amount of support from people who are... Uh, and these are people who are not necessarily voting yes. And I think that's important to, to bear that in mind. In relation to, to tackling um, racism, uh, one of the memories I do have is campaigning when there was racist incidents in Muirhouse. And this was about 20 years ago. And some of you remember Muirhouse Against Racism campaign. Yeah, yes. And we confronted it quickly and early. And we made sure that people came together and we stood up in solidarity and said, no, we're not having this in our community and we're not having it in Scotland. And one of the things that we are doing as a government is making sure, and we have it in the white paper in terms of an independent Scotland, yes, we'll have a controlled immigration system, but we'll have a Scotland that welcomes those who want to live and work and study and contribute to Scotland. And as Colin said, immigrants to Scotland pay more in taxes than they receive in anything else. And hard-working and contributing. And in West Lothian, we have a very strong Polish uh, community, many of whom now settled in Scotland. And when halls closed, they stayed because the children were at our schools contributing. And that's the type of Scotland that we should have. And one of the first things, it's also about symbolism. And one of the first things I did as a minister was to make law to change the fact that if you're an asylum seeker coming to Scotland and you're a child of an asylum seeker, you had no hope of going to university because you'd be whacked with international fees. And within weeks, and that's when we got elected in May, and in August, I changed the law to make sure that young people, for their children of asylum seekers, when they came to our Scotland, that they were treated as our children because I found a way in the law to make sure, in terms of the welfare of children comes first, was to make sure they had the same right as anybody else. That's the type of Scotland that we can be, and that's the type of signal. Sometimes it is about signal. I could you close Dungavo down, but I could do something else instead. Just think of the possibilities of the beacon of hope that we can have to many communities. But you've got to stand up and you've got to stand firm. And thank you for your contribution. Because he's been trying again for you all. I fell asleep twice, so. <laughs> no, I just like to ask the top table. I'm old enough, in fact, I think I'm older than him. Even. How is this vote going to be calculated? Because if, the reason I'm saying that right away, if you remember the last time there was a vote, the majority voted for, but we didn't get it because of this 40% differential. I think it was mm -hmm. government, am I right, Mrs. Watson? I'm not as old as that. I can't remember. Well, <laughs> the forty percent rule uh, was brought in so that there had to be a higher percentage. That's right. That, that's, that's, not in this, that's not in this referendum. It's just a straightforward fifty percent plus one of those who vote or of the electorate. And the dead are not included either. The dead are not included either, which is the well and the Lynn Cunningham's uh, amendment to the original legislation. It's, it's fifty percent of those who vote. What is likely to happen is we expect that there will be a big turnout for this yeah. referendum, far bigger than maybe you get for normal elections that we have. This right. is different, so it's a, a, a big vote, big turnout, but it's it's the majority. Just strictly fifty percent plus one. Why is there not plus one? Yeah. Right. yeah, one more. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the question really is, welcome to the North Edinburgh. Actually, the North, North Edinburgh has got some of the poorest areas in the whole of the country. People who live in this area 
uh, and they are need of some kind of support. And right now, the No campaign is doing nothing to support that. The Yes campaign can do something in this area to win the vote. When you go up and down the streets as we were, when we were out canvassing, you find that Block 5, Flat 1 has got a vote, Flat 2 doesn't have a vote, Flat 3 has a vote, Flat 4 doesn't have a vote. The amount of people in this area who didn't have a vote because there's no register to vote, whether they're Spanish, Italian, Polish or Tiltonese, right? The problem is that we have got a whole population in this area who have got a reason to vote yes. Because no doesn't give them any kind of hope. Neoliberalism gives them no hope. We need to organise ourselves as people in this area to make sure that we fight beyond the vote for yes. So that everything that we want is in the Scotland that we want. And it's not handy to tap in Tories or bosses who come on board. We need a different kind of society. One in which we control. Working class people control. That's the kind of Scotland. And I'll tell you what that could be. That could be the beacon that when you went to the independence game, when Scots wrote the independence path, when the French Revolution was Scots who were radical, who wanted a different kind of world, and wrote it, and these people captured it and put it on. The new enlightenment for Scotland is so what we can do. We can be a beacon for about how we treat people and know how we crush people and, and make profit out of them. And that's the kind of Scotland I believe a yes has got the potential. No has got no potential. Can you imagine a map with the nose like we had? Right, well I wonder. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, Rob, we're not going to have time for any more questions, yeah. think, uh, because uh, I, I, we're back to Janice again. Uh, could I, um, you, well, first of all, thank you all for coming. Uh, could I thank the panellists and the people who organised this meeting on, uh, on the Yes campaign's behalf? And could I just say in closing that when I first decided, which was quite a long time ago now actually, that I was going to vote Yes, I wasn't over the moon uh, optimism-wise, as far as a likely victory was concerned, because at that point in time, the polls were showing us to be dithering down in the, down in the bottom, dirty or whatever. I think things have changed. I was listening to the Mori man on BBC on Saturday morning, who was saying that although these um, incremental increases for, for the Yes campaign are small, relatively small, he says that the important issue is that they indicate a movement. And that movement is maybe slow at the moment, but it's starting to pick up and start to pick up even more. There are two things that I would like to say just before we do uh, end up. Each one of us will know people, and I've already done this myself actually, has the opportunity to convince one other person who has not committed themselves to the Yes campaign. And one of the best ways to do it is to put the badge on because people, <laughs> whether they're for or against, they just can't resist talking about it. And since I started doing it, the number of people who have engaged me, complete strangers, uh, has been quite significant. And I've been buoyed with the view that things are going in our, in our direction against, you know, a media that is not supportive enough of the campaign. So it's down to, in a sense, I'm, I'm saying, hopefully, I'm a less time than Willie, uh, that there is an opportunity for us all here if we take it. And I, I wouldn't do a kind of David Steele and say, go back to your constituencies and prepare for government, but certainly go out on the streets and try and increase the yes vote over the next few months. Thank you very much for being here.
I'm not going to talk about doubt and confusion On a night when I can see with my shut I'm not going to talk about doubt and confusion On a night when I can see with my shut I'm not going to talk about doubt and confusion On a night when I can see with my shut I'm not going to talk about it 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 I've never been to Asia Hey, snow on Saturday Sit him up, come on it To see a man in play The deal is bright and sunny But the game I won't relay And it was so come on it, man it's To make me want to stay But I'm not gonna talk about it On a when I can see with my shots No The West Shore, my eyes obscured my vision. I took five miles on my way. I began to learn the lesson. When I started walking the West Shore, my eyes obscured my vision. I took five miles on my way. I began to learn the lesson. And I'm not gonna talk about it. All I when I can see with my shots. I've been saying, I've been saying. All I when I can see with my shots. Country, I walk through the town. I held my head up and I suddenly yeah, done. I walk through the country, I walk through the town. I held my head up and I didn't look down. And I'm not so good at talk about it. All night when I can see with my shots. Morning sky, morning sky. All night when I can see with my shots. Doesn't matter, the answer's always I The best you have always met that light meets the sky The question doesn't matter, the answer's always I The best you have always met that light meets the sky If I am not gonna talk about it Or like when I can see with my shots Yeah.